Britons are making 1.2 billion train journeys a year, more than ever before. But 50 years ago, Britain's railways were in a real mess, and people were deserting them in their millions. Then two visionary engineers imagined a tilting train that could run twice as fast as anything on our rails. Well, we tracked down these two pioneers who dreamt of saving Britain's railways by building a train capable of doing over 150 miles an hour on Britain's twisting rail system. One or two people felt we were a lot of upstarts. The difficulty was with people not believing that it could be done. They just simply say, it's a load of rubbish. It's just one of those iconic pieces of British engineering. We've never seen anything like it. This is the story of two maverick engineers and their space-age tilting train that was so ahead of its time that it brought Britain's railways to a grinding halt. In the 1960s, Britain's railways were under threat. Trains were no match for increasingly affordable air travel and the speed and convenience of motorways. At the time, trains were averaging just 60 miles an hour. To survive, British Rail had to increase speeds and make journey time shorter. It was quite obvious to the British Rail Board and to the government that the future of the railways was about speed. But in the 60s, high speeds were a pipe dream for British Rail. Post-war France and Japan spent billions laying dead straight track for their new high-speed trains. But Britain was stuck with 20,000 miles of snaking railways. We had the problem that nobody else had. We had a railway with corners. And trains definitely don't like corners. In a desperate bid for fresh ideas, in 1962, Tired old British Rail created a radical new research department. But to the disgust of British Rail's own engineers, they recruited people with no experience of the railways at all. This new department was headed by a 30-year-old firebrand called Alan Wickens, a man who'd cut his teeth on planes and missiles and who knew absolutely nothing about trains. The reason that I was recruited was certainly the fact that I was a fresh mind with no preconceived notions of uh, existing railway technology. Alan soon recruited another outsider, Mike Newman, an engineer from the National Coal Board, who'd barely ridden a train, let alone designed one. I recognised that I was joining a team of research engineers who knew what they were doing, and they had some great ideas, which I thought were groundbreaking. British Rail's hopes were resting on the shoulders of Alan and his team of outsiders. Their task was to design a train that could run at high speed on our curved railways. For every one mile an hour increase in average speed, you got 1% more revenue. Speed was the way forward. But with speed came danger. If a train hit a curve too fast, Powerful centrifugal forces made it impossible for customers to stay in their seats. If a conventional train hit a sharp curve at very high speed, people would be flung all over the place. Alan's team wrestled with the problem of passenger comfort for months. Finally, a solution was found in the way a motorbike whizzes round bends by tilting. A motorcyclist, as he goes around a curve, naturally balances the centrifugal forces and does so by leaning. The answer to British Rail's crippling problems was a train that could imitate how a motorbike takes corners at speed. The solution to travelling fast on curved railways was the tilting train because the passenger would not feel the full effect of the lateral acceleration, rather like a motorcycle rider in a curve. Alan recognised making an existing train tilt wouldn't be enough. His team of outsiders had to create the single most advanced rail vehicle in the world, where every component was an innovation. Better braking, 
better steering, different power systems, lightweight, the whole train, not just simply the one item of a tilting train. They proposed a revolutionary locomotive that would top an incredible 150 miles an hour, faster than any British train that had ever been before. Allen knew the design for the tilting mechanism would be the key to success, and he created the world's first powered tilting system using two rows of hydraulic jacks positioned under the train's carriage. They would lift one side of the train as it entered a curve. Allen worked out the perfect tilt was nine degrees, just enough to displace the centrifugal forces and keep passengers comfortable. But Allen's design caused uproar. British Rail did have the courage to employ cutting-edge scientists, but they ran scared of pinning their future strategy on their radical ideas. The ideas of tilting were not taken seriously by the railway. I remember being challenged at a talk at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers by being told that what I was saying was rubbish. The engineering side of the railways was very conservative. They took science into the railway where the railway didn't want science. I mean, it was a clash, a complete clash of ideologies. Dismissing the establishment's lack of foresight, Allen's team spent the next three years completing their design on paper. But to turn it into a working prototype, they'd need serious cash, five million pounds, and British Rail's pockets were already empty. Got to remember, British Railways was in a parlous financial situation at this stage, making huge losses. I guess at the time, uh, when you're a fairly young man and you see your career ahead of you and it seems to be going nowhere, standing with a begging bowl for a couple of years uh, seems to be a very long time. By 1967, Allen and his team were still desperate for funds when their research department had a visit from an ambitious Tory MP. Well, one of these visitors that we had was uh, Margaret Thatcher. I was very impressed, I must say. I think she's a very keen mind. She waved away the, the entourage who wanted to try to move her on to the next presentation. She just wanted everything out of me that she could, and she pummeled me and pummeled me, seeking more information out of me about the economics of the railways. It's not known whether Margaret Thatcher brought any direct pressure on the money men, but finally, in 1969, Alan and Mike were given the green light, enough funding to build their tilting train. You don't have time to start uh, uh, opening champagne bottles. You've got to start uh, getting to work and produce a train. Their first check was spent building specialist workshops in Derby, soon to be filled with 150 contract engineers. The chief technical officer came from the motor industry, hard-working Kit Spackman. At one stage, the Advanced Projects Division had the highest ratio of failed marriages in the whole of BR. Um, it doesn't surprise me, really, because uh, we were working the most silly hours. There were no half measures for British Rail. With millions invested, they told the world about their glittering new project. British Rail was saying that this was the cornerstone of their policy. They envisaged that about 60 of these trains would be whizzing up and down the West Coast Main Line, and they really had tremendous hopes placed in it. Under extraordinary pressure, Allen's team of outsiders began to build the world's most advanced passenger train. The tilting system was entirely automatic. Jacks pushed the vehicle into the rolled position. They were operated by a control system which was picking up the lateral acceleration felt on the vehicle as it went round the curve. The area that I worked in specifically was the entire tilt system, which needed a fair amount of expertise and probably more than I had to start with, but in that sort of environment, you learnt very quickly. One of the things that we had to do was work out which way round the accelerometers had to go, because if it was the wrong way round, the train would not just tilt the wrong way, it would fall over, and it did, more than once. Traditionally, trains were made of steel, but this was far too heavy if the train was to tilt. So Allen dared to use a lightweight metal used for years to build aeroplanes, aluminium. 
Well, aluminium was the natural choice, uh, having had experience in the aircraft industry. It has the highest strength-weight ratio. So you had this unique situation where the railway suddenly went into the aero industry, and that was a first. By 1971, all these innovations had been rolled into a super train years ahead of its time. And this is it, the advanced passenger train experimental. It may be confined to a museum now, but back then it was the stuff of science fiction. It was aerodynamic. It was made of lightweight aluminium. It had radical new wheels and suspension. And it could fly around corners at high speed thanks to its hydraulic tilt. The APTE was British Rail's great hope for the future. One felt very proud of the whole project, of course. Oh, I thought it looked marvellous. <laughs> oh, it was like a spaceship on wheels. It, it'd be difficult to not be impressed by it. You got an impression of, wow, look at this, we're really doing something clever here. The purpose of the APT in many respects was to show the art of the possible into the future. Alan Wickham, without a doubt, it, it was a genius. We really believed the railway had arrived. In 1972, full of confidence, the British Rail Board announced the tilting train was ready for its historic first test run. The event should have brought the railways into a new era. Instead, it was to bring Britain to a grinding halt. In the 1970s, British Rail profits were plummeting and it had pinned its hopes on a revolutionary tilting train. Designed by a groundbreaking research team at British Rail, the APTE was built to reach 150 miles an hour, taking bends 40% faster than any other train before it. It was meant to be British Rail's saving grace. At least, that was the theory. The tilting train's legendary first test run took place on the 25th of July, 1972. A simple four-mile trip from Derby to Duffield. The objective was to see how the train handled at low speed. The tilting system would be tested later. The first run was certainly uh, feelings of apprehension uh, through the train. The train's power came from 10 untried gas turbines. They'd been supplied by a new engineering company, British Leyland. You got to remember those turbines were experimental too, and there were difficulties. The train managed the four-mile trip, but only three of the gas turbines worked. It was clear much more development was needed. It didn't seem particularly uh, uh, successful <laughs> at the time, but there was a much greater disaster coming. As soon as the test run was over, Alan and Mike received news that threatened to cripple the entire project. Aslev, the train driver's union, was kicking up a stink about the design of the train's cab. In the early 70s, trains all had two drivers, but the APTE was built with room for only one. Incredibly, British Rail hadn't agreed the principle of using just a single driver with the union. Aslev was furious that potentially half their drivers could lose their jobs and the union announced their members were banned from ever driving the tilting train. This was an absolute disaster. The whole project seemed to collapse, and the morale of the team fell to absolute floor level. With the prototype needing modifications, the train was moved back to Derby by a non-union manager. Aslef was outraged and called a national strike. Suddenly, the tilting train was responsible for bringing Britain to a halt and it cost British Rail over a million pounds. If they'd added a million pounds that that cost British Rail to my project, I think we would have uh, failed to continue. The public perception of the project was now badly tainted, and work on the tilting train was suspended. After the battle with the drivers' union, the APT might simply have rusted away like this, were it not for the exceptional resolve and determination of our British engineers. 
after an eight-week period of nothing happening, we reorganised ourselves and the project seemed to burst into life again. The train needed substantial repairs and so did its tattered reputation. To capture the hearts and minds of the public, Alan hatched a plot to grab the headlines. In a remarkable show of self-belief, the engineers aimed high at the British Rail speed record. Their attempt would be made on the 10th of August, 1975. It was a daring move designed to silence the train's critics. With the driver's ban lifted, the team set off from Uffington Station at 10.20 a.m. The fastest a British train had ever managed before was 144 miles an hour. I said to my colleagues, somehow or other, you've got to make it run at 150 miles an hour today, boys. The gas turbines had been modified and the tilt system was operating smoothly. The speed steadily increased. The tilt system was tilting, the brakes were braking, the power turbines were giving their all, the suspension was working absolutely beautifully going around the corner. We're 123 now. Finally, word came down to push the train for all she was worth. We wanted to go, obviously, as fast as the train was capable of going. Everything was absolutely full power. Just after midday, the tilting train roared into the record books with an astonishing 152.3 miles an hour. The morale of people couldn't have been higher. One of my colleagues said, if it had gone wrong, I think we'd have pushed it. It was a very impressive train at high speed, and even more impressive to ride in it when it was tilting. It's just one of those iconic pieces of British engineering that at the time was so revolutionary, you can't really explain to people who now who take mobile phones and computers and the internet and MySpace and YouTube for granted. You can't explain to them. This was a real train, the future of railways. But we can reveal that the record-breaking run came perilously close to failure. I have a little admission to make. During that test, some of the communication system failed. And <laughs> we actually managed to achieve the target despite the disaster on the electronics. Did the press discover this uh, disaster? Or... You were the first person to ever know. Over the next few years, Alan and his team fine-tuned the tilting train, proving time and again that hours could be saved on long-distance routes. By 1976, the research phase was complete. It was time for Alan and Mike to say goodbye to their creation. It was now up to BR's traditional engineers to push tilting trains into production. At this point, um, my responsibility for APT finished. I handed over the project to other people and uh, indeed even left the railways. Alan and Mike's job was done. They delivered some of the most advanced technology in the world to British Rail. But why didn't tilting trains now take over the whole country? In the late 70s, British Rail's in-house engineers chose to change Alan's design. The hydraulic tilt was replaced with air springs and three trains were rushed into service. The big launch was on the 7th of December, 1981, running from Glasgow to London Euston. On board were the first paying customers and a group of journalists keen for a story. Kit Spackman also bagged a seat. As the sun came up and we were going around Abington Curve at the time, it was a very, very long left-hand curve, it then became apparent that the train was doing its tilting thing exactly as it was designed to do and the horizon was going up and down and uh, the first instances of the dreaded tilt sickness occurred. The winter temperatures had caused the mechanisms to freeze up and the train's smooth tilt turned into a noticeable jerk. The shock was when it tilted. Suddenly, the public were travelling on the train and people were going, I feel sick. You are sitting, drinking your coffee, and then it went, whoom, and your coffee went, Chit! over the next person sitting next to you. Obviously, on a press run, that was disastrous and the, the press coverage was adverse, to say the least. Legend has it that the reason the press hammered the tilting train was because the night before, they'd got hammered themselves with a free bar at their hotel. Yes, I think some of the, the press had perhaps overindulged the night before. It did uh, 
introduce what I think has become known as tilt nausea. You know, we're starting with this new train. Did you really expect it to be perfect, 100% first time out? The press really sort of hammered BR over this. After only three days, the tilting train was withdrawn from scheduled service. After years of tinkering, it was quietly reintroduced on the West Coast main line, but was never reliable. In 1985, the British Rail Board finally lost patience and pulled the plug on the tilting train. The train was put into service prematurely. It hadn't achieved the necessary state of reliability, and there were failures. The board made some very bad decisions. A bit more application, a bit more effort here and there, and we could have had trains like that in service years and years ago. Things could have been so good. The multi-million pound project was deemed suitable only for scrap, and so the trains were unceremoniously torn to shreds. What happened was it was like, get rid of it, and we never want to see it again. But that wasn't the last time tilting trains would run on British tracks. Ironically, in 1998, we turned to Europe. 13 years after the project was closed down, Virgin Rail realized the potential of tilting technology. But with no British trains to buy, they spent £1.2 billion on a fleet of Pendolinos, Italian tilting trains from Fiat developed using much of the technology that Wickens and Newman had created. It is a cruel and bitter irony. I am very sad that uh, it isn't a British design. That is a matter of great regret. Today, there are over 80 Italian tilting trains operating in the UK, but none of them would exist without the genius of our British engineers. Mm -hmm.